Thank you guys for coming today on this Sunday, uh, March 10th, 2013. Um, it's really a great pleasure to see all of you guys coming out today. Um, you know, we're here today for many reasons, um, one of which is to first um, remember the, the victims who have been affected by uh, this unfortunate catastrophe that happened two years ago in Japan. Um, However, today, we're hoping to focus on the positive aspects about the different initiatives and projects that these well-renowned speakers that we've invited today, um, and we're hoping to focus on that aspect. Um, we're hoping that this symposium stimulates critical dialogue amongst not only the speakers, not only the organizers, but also you guys. We're hoping that we can first start the conversation and keep this conversation going for in the future. Um, the speakers will inspire us and challenge us to really think critically about what we can do as individuals. Um, you know, what started out as a simple Google Doc turned into an event like this. Um, so don't underestimate the power of the individual. Don't underestimate the power of collaboration. And I think the speakers we invited here today really, really um, convey that message. So uh, um, without further ado, uh, oh, before I forget, my name is Kent Nakazawa. I'm a junior at Columbia University School of Engineering and Applied Science. Hi, my name is Sayaka Tuno from Barnard College. Um, so again, we have an awesome lineup of speakers here today. Um, so for our first guest, we have Susan Onimo. She's actually a graduate of Barnard College she is a uh, partner with the law firm Kelly, Dry, and Warren LLP. And most importantly, she has been active in fundraising efforts in Toboku. Um, she's a board member of the Japanese American Association here in New York. And she has worked with the U.S. Japan Council and, and Society. So without further ado, uh, welcome Susan Onoma to the stage. And especially, I haven't been to Barnard in so many years, I'm almost embarrassed, I should be ashamed of myself. But this is a great uh, facility and venue. Um, I'm honored to welcome all of you here this afternoon um, to this very thought-provoking symposium, Creative Responses and Social Imagination. Um, as any of, many of you know, the consortium for Japan release uh, was started uh, by students, faculty, and staff of the Columbia University um, campus and it has expanded to its supporters and friends. Um, today, they're planning a unique program that is not only innovative, but interactive. Uh, a symposium that we hope will remind us all of the need to continue a critical dialogue and use our imaginations to think why Tokoku still matters. A symposium that we hope will be the catalyst for new and creative collaborations, friendships, and of course, people-to-people -people connections. Uh, today's program is planned largely by the multidisciplinary members of the student bodies here and student leaders. Um, I'd like to, in particular, uh, point out Dayu Suzuki and Matt Andrini, uh, who are the organizers of today's event, as well as Fred Tsunagawa, Kenny Nakazawa, and Saiba Tsudo. If I've left anyone out, I'm sorry. Um, I didn't get a chance to meet you and hope to do so later. Um, the group would also like to thank, um, in addition to all of you attending today, the sponsors who are listed on your program to help fund um, and defray the cost of today's program. Um, as Kenny mentioned, I'm an attorney by profession, uh, but uh, I'm also on the board of several uh, organizations that I'm proud to say have really stepped up to the plate with respect to uh, Toho Kulik post 311. Um, and I would like to um, emphasize again, as Kenny mentioned, that we should really not underestimate the power of people-to-people -people connections and the personal experiences. Because I believe that all three organizations have been so effective and successful because of the leadership in those organizations. Uh, for example, um, both Japan Society and JAA are over 100 years old. Um, but Japan Society is currently headed by its first Japanese president, Motatsu Sakurai, um, who is not only the former general counsel of New York, Council General of New York, but he was also the former president of Mitsubishi Corporation in New York. JA is currently headed by um, 
President Gary Morlucky, who is sitting right up front, um, and its Executive Director Michio Yoda, who does the day-to-day -day operations, both of whom were in Tokyo on 311. And they left me uh, in Europe to man the phones and field all the media inquiries. But I have to tell you that there's nothing more powerful than uh, personal connections to 311 to empower and motivate one uh, to take action. The U.S. Japan Council is less than five years old, um, but is headed by Irene Toronto Inoue, the late widow of Senator, uh, I'm sorry, the widow of the late Senator Daniel Inoue. Um, she was also the past president of the Japanese American National Museum. The organization had just started to um, get close to Ambassador Ruth, the U.S. Ambassador to Japan, when 311 happened, and therefore it was really a no-brainer to um, accept his request to help with the Tomodachi Fund um, once it was established. So these uh, three organizations um, are all interested in funding sustainable projects for the future, including a special focus on the next generation of Japan. I think all of us know the malaise and lack of passion. Uh, people have complained about the young people of Japan. Uh, it's been a serious issue. And for many outside of the Tohoku area, I think 311 was the wake-up call for them that now is something that they could do that was meaningful and to help out. So I know many have left Tokyo or you know, Osaka or other areas of comfort and have gone to Tohoku to help. Um, but also for the people in Tohoku, I think they were astonished um, of the overwhelming response from all over the world from countries that they never even heard of. So it's um, nice to hear that now there's a huge interest of the young people of Tohoku to study abroad. And I think that's a great uh, segue into the next generation of uh, bicultural uh, leadership. Um, there's also um, the, uh, we want to build on the momentum and engage these young people and also to support them. And I strongly encourage all of you that if you know programs or people who want to get involved to, to let us know because we do still, still have some funds available. We do do our due diligence, um, so we, there is paperwork involved, but I wanted to take this opportunity to say that. Um, with respect to the arts, um, the Japan Society, as many of you know, has supported numerous groups, um, including Arch Arch Aid, which funds architect-led community revitalization projects, the Association for the Corporate Support of the Arts, which funded the restarting of traditional festivals and villages throughout Tohoku, and the Japan Community Cinema, which started showing films in the region, including uh, temporary housing. Um, in addition, Japan Society has three programs uh, this week, uh, one tonight, which is the film um, that starts at 6 p.m., um, and then there are two other programs tomorrow and Tuesday. Um, you can go on their website to find out more information. Um, the U.S. Japan, Japan Council through the Tumodachi Fund has also supported various arts projects, including Art in the Box, which brought um, art, helped children in Japan recover through art. Um, and also, some of you may have heard that Lady Gaga had um, auctioned off her teacup. Um, that money was helped to um, uh, start a fellowship to bring promising young artists to New York State to train with other artists. And Uniqlo has um, funded two scholarships for students to study at the Parsons School of Design in FIT. And these are all being administered through the Tomodachi Fund. I think um, we all know that Japan is a country of what we call rules. You know, they have rules for everything. And while it served uh, Japan well shortly after the crisis, when the world marveled over the Japanese uh, people's sense of politeness, orderliness, uh, lack of looting or chaos or mass hysteria. Um, I think many of us today are frustrated, disappointed, and frankly, a bit angry with the lack of um, speed in which funds are being distributed or utilized throughout the uh, region and where the needs are, are huge. Um, because due to these same rules, uh, there's a seeming inability of bureaucrats and politicians to think outside of the box and bend these rules. Um, it is also very difficult as a person here, uh, and frankly embarrassing, uh, that you can need to raise funds or sympathy for Tohoku 
Um, when people read in the Wall Street Journal that not only has the Japanese government allocated $266 billion for reconstruction over four years, but nearly $12 billion was returned unspent. $12 billion. So think of all the good that we can all do for that kind of money. The same article in the Wall Street Journal, though, also went on to tell the heartwarming story of Mr. Teichi Sato, who is the owner of a seed shop um, in Likuzen Takara, who learned to take matters into his own hands rather than wait for all the government red tape to unwind. As he said, he realized there was no use to complain. He already did that last year. You have to find your own way, he said. In addition to rebuilding his seed shop out of scraps, he has found an outlet for his frustration and sadness by expressing his thoughts in English, because some words were too painful in Japanese. Uh, you'd be happy to know that he has published a book titled The Seed of Hope in the Heart, which has sold 1,000 copies. And perhaps we should um, contribute and buy some of those. So if there's anything um, that comes out of this symposium, I would like to, to be, how can we teach Japan to think outside of the box? I find it hard to fathom how there could be a shortage of construction workers while those in the fishing industry remain unemployed and idling. When asked about the cross-training, the answer was, well, they were fishermen, not construction workers. I find it telling that the symposium <coughs> held here on Florida uh, College, the symposium on creative responses, because of course it is now the women of Tohoku who are stepping up to the plate and multitasking at whatever they can do to keep their livelihood and families together. When I went to Sendai uh, last March, I went with a group of um, Japanese American leaders, and it was interesting for us to know that the people of Tohoku were very eager to hear the story of the Japanese American experience during World War II, when over 110,000 people of Japanese ancestry were uprooted from their homes and put in concentration camps throughout the United States. What was uncanny is that the temporary housing that we saw outside of Sendai reminded so many of us of the barracks that we used in the camps. And currently, I'm um, pleased to say that there is an art exhibit that's going through Fukushima um, just this week called The Art of Gaban. It is a collection of artifacts uh, made by Japanese Americans during World War II from the materials found in the harsh environment which is a testament to the resilience of spirit and the notion that beautiful things can come out of tragic circumstances. So by embarking on grassroots people-to-people -people exchanges and connections, projects and collaborations, you'll see that we can all make a difference one step at a time. And whether it takes billions, of, while it may take billions to rebuild the infrastructure of Tohoku, it only takes a kind heart and warm smile to rekindle the spirit and form a human bond, or Kizuna. Today, we have a great and diverse, fascinating panel of speakers that I'm sure you'll all be interested in hearing from, the doctors, architects, community organizers, and artists. There's, um, there's a lot of uh, motive and momentum, and as I said earlier today, um, the program is intended to be interactive. So each of the speakers have embarked on their own journey, uh, and they want to share those stories to you, but they also want to hear your stories and to learn from all of you. Um, today, we're not looking to raise funds, but to draw upon your intellect. You all have tremendous skills, expertise, and ideas that Japan needs so that we can continue to expand the many creative ways in which to help Japan heal. As Dayu Suzuki, one of the um, organizers of today's event, said to me, I do not want people to think of Tohoku as just a geographic area for the site of a tragic disaster. But I want it to be the catalyst for Japan's rebirth, its national wake-up call, the source of social consciousness and reconstruction. All of you are here today because we care. So without further ado, I'd like to start the program and let's us all be inspired and be part of the change. Thank you. <laughs>
Next speaking will be Dr. Robert Yanagisawa. Dr. Yanagisawa is an Associate Professor of Medicine at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. He is also a Program Director with Clinical Fellowship in Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Metabolism. He is also a board member of the Japanese Medical Society of America. Today he will be speaking to you about how he led a team of the 9-11 Family Association to disaster-stricken areas in Iwate, Miyagi, and Fukushima. Oh. <laughs> Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, my name is Robert Hanagisawa. Thank you very much for that introduction and uh, the organizers of this uh, um, uh, consortium. Uh, thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, yes, uh, I, I'm here representing Japanese Medical Society of America, um, which is a, a, a basically network of physicians uh, collaborating with the um, uh, interest to Japan. Um, and uh, as well as the Mount Global Health. Um, we've done a lot of projects uh, since the day, day one of the uh, 3.11, but um, I'm here to talk about the, the one specific project we did uh, uh, last year. Actually, this project uh, was uh, brought about to life um, when uh, Ms. Uh, Betty Borden from uh, Japan Society um, introduced us to um, uh, two members of the uh, 11 Family Association at uh, this symposium last year um, and uh, came about with a very interesting um, feature that is, well, nine, group of 9-11 Family Association, which is a, uh, comprised of uh, uh, disaster victims, survivors, family members, uh, neighbors of uh, Ground Zero, and they said, we want to go to Japan, help out with the uh, recovery of Japan. How can we do this? We don't know where to start and where to go. Um, and that's how it started. Uh, 10 months, or almost 11 months later, I guess, um, uh, this project came through. So uh, it had a three to four fold um, uh, mission. Uh, one was to build a memorial uh, as a symbol for recovery. Um, it, we felt that uh, Japan needed uh, uh, at least a, a symbol where uh, people can congregate and uh, uh, reminisce or, or remember about 311. Um, we made school visits because um, the school children are at one of the most uh, you know, vulnerable for these disasters. We also wanted to make a person-to-person -person dialogue between the disaster victims and disaster victims, uh, something that uh, not easily shared by um, those who have not gone through this kind of process. And uh, how this came about by through collaboration of different organizations. Um, so this is the soaring crane we named it. Uh, it's fabricated uh, with the steel um, from actual ground zero. Uh, so it has a lot of significance uh, and memory. And why crane? Um, there was a, actually it goes back to some uh, 50 you know years ago. Uh, Sadako Suzuki. Um, a 12-year-old girl um, who died of uh, leukemia after surviving for Hiroshima bombing. Um, and because of the high-dose radiation, she got sick and, uh, and died. But in her um, bed, bedside, she kept on folding um, these uh, little paper cranes. And uh, this was a, a purely her wish to, that she felt that if she had folded a thousand cranes, that she, her wish would come through. Unfortunately, she did not make it to a thousand cranes. Um, I believe um, 850 some uh, cranes. And the, one of her last crane is actually dedicated to a treatment center in uh, World Trade Center, a ground zero site. Um, this move really moved 9/11 um, uh, people, and it really uh, gave them strong moral support. And that's why they wanted to go. So, they felt so strongly about going back to Japan and returning such favor. Um, we made a story uh, of how Sadako in this uh, on a red crane um, is flying back with her colleagues from 9/11 World Trade Center Tribute Center, um, and we wanted to hopefully lead to this sort of happy face kids playing around in Fukushima. Well, so this is the actual crane, and we delivered it 
uh, on the day of Sadako's anniversary, 58th anniversary. Um, it was accepted by uh, uh, Oriyama City in Fukushima, where one of the highest population of uh, evacuees from Fukushima Daiichi Power Plant is now uh, uh, relocated. We've had a very formal um, Shinto uh, shrine, uh, Shinto uh, dedication of this crane. Uh, we made school visits. We made a special school visit. Uh, this is a school of death. Um, again, the, uh, the, the kids received this uh, storybook beforehand, and we read them while we were there. Uh, they had uh, prepared this sort of such a wonderful welcome sign, and uh, it, it took some collaboration because uh, obviously, as the principal is making a speech, and the translator to, to his uh, to his left is making translation into English. And then the translator um, to his right is making in Han Sign language. Um, the school has a, a, a rather uh, large population in the sense they come, they go from small kids to large kids. The small kids were delivered um, uh, emergency helmets from the Rotary. The junior high school kids had a more sort of a serious conversation: Why we're there? What are we doing? Um, what does it mean for them? We visited also another elementary school uh, where Kaoru Elementary School, which has uh, one of the highest radiation dose on their school grounds. It's been cleaned up, but uh, this sort of, um, as you can imagine, uh, this sort of a large uh, silent sign is uh, giving out off the radiation sign. We made a school project. Uh, one of my uh, colleagues at Mount Sinai Global Health, uh, his daughter, 10 year old daughter, went. Um, and brought a school project. Uh, her classmates folded, uh, they couldn't follow the paper crane, so they folded the uh, paper Empire State Building. And why Empire State Building, you might say? Well, it, uh, um, it served after the 9-11, the, uh, the Empire State Building served as a really a sign of resilience for New York City. So, so she gave this uh, the school project to her, uh, her, her, her uh, these class, uh, kids in uh, Colorado Elementary School. She Skyped it to uh, her classmates in, um, back in Brooklyn, um, and the kids are very happy then. Um, we also made a person-to-person -person dialogue. Um, the, this woman uh, in the picture is talking about how she lost her only daughter, um, and she's one to live out her dreams of going to the United States and seeing the show and whatnot. Uh, well, immediately, 9-11 uh, family members uh, took out various pictures. This is my only lost son. Uh, this is my only lost daughter. And these, uh, you could see the bonding that happened. Um, and this was uh, held at the uh, Ishinomaki Karakoro Station. Karakoro uh, means body and uh, um, heart, um, appropriate uh, term for the station. Um, we visited the Fukushima Shinchimachi. Uh, it's north of the power plant and uh, where these temporary health housing shelters are. We made a, again, um, really person-to-person -person dialogue, trying to break into a small groups and discussing. Um, the person here is actually Craig Katz, who's the disaster uh, psychiatry specialist that uh, we've been working together. Um, sometimes we uh, collab, uh, communicated through translation, sometimes we communicated through written languages, Sometimes it was the iPad. Um, and I said uh, this is uh, brought up uh, by collaboration. Um, here, this was a meeting held at the Japan Foundation um, fairly soon after the, uh, this, this symposium last year. Um, David Jane is the, uh, representing the US uh, Japan Foundation. Um, Lee ILP, the president of 9 11 Association, uh, Mary. Uh, who is the curator of the museum, and uh, Betty, who is here today, um, and my wife, uh, representing Rotary, and myself. Um, we came together to see how this can uh, make it happen. We did some fundraising for this event. Um, uh, we've had a, a special um, consulate uh, members uh, involved. Uh, we've had a, a Rotary uh, who put in a lot of um, effort to support this, and obviously uh, our organizations. 
um, it brought together really a people to people um, network. And in the end, we had a very fun time. We made it sure that we needed to uh, get an um, adequate media exposure. Um, as uh, Susan said before, uh, things are being forgotten there. And the people in, in um, uh, Tohoku are most worried about is that they're being forgotten. So we made sure um, we contacted and we made over a total, I think over about 30 newspaper headlines. Uh, we brought uh, three news stations with us, um, broadcasted nationally. Um, and, you know, when um, um, the U.S. Uh, happens, uh, I think U.S. and this sort of collaboration happens that uh, um, the media can listen, which is good. Um, and then we made sure also we had a um, official recognition as well with the Ministry of Reconstruction then, uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, and this is really about the, in the end, um, this is our team uh, of a Japan Relief Team. Um, some of the uh, Miyuki and Lindsay are uh, medical students in, uh, with the JMSA who have been really, really strongly involved with the translation, <coughs> preparing documents, um, making uh, sure all these happens, uh, putting us on the web. Um, Kamal uh, Ramani, Dr. Ramani was one of the first uh, uh, responders uh, among the JMSA to head to Japan while well, there was uh, no running water, no electricity. Uh, he just dove in there. Um, and Dr. Homa and myself, certainly, we've been uh, really uh, working together um, to make this happen. And uh, I think we'll continue to make it happen. Um, this was a, one of the examples we felt that uh, uh, it was a unique uh, support of uh, collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yanagisawa. Our next guest is Dr. Homa. He is the Margaret Milton Hatch Professor of Medicine and Associate Chief of the Cardiology Division at the Columbia University Medical Center. He is the president of GMSnet, which is one of the major main sponsors for this event today. Um, and more importantly, he is uh, our faculty advisor for CGR. Uh, he's someone that I uh, hope to you know, work with in the future in my profession. Um, because he's a really a prominent figure when it comes to uh, Japan Relief. He has led efforts to enhance mental health initiatives in the Tohoku region, establishing outpatient mental health cares, health clinics in Fukushima and Iwate prefectures. So, come up. First, uh, thank you very much everyone for coming to this event. And also I'd like to uh, really congratulate the student leaders who has organized this wonderful event. So, in the next five to 10 minutes, I'd like to talk to you about what we've done three years ago in terms of our initiative from the Japanese Medical Society of America. So, after the uh, disaster, uh, we decided we wanted to do something. And we wanted to target something. And we wanted to do something other people don't do. And we thought mental health is something that people don't really look after. We, we didn't want to send blankets, we didn't want to send milk, but we thought we should do something other people cannot do. And we wanted to do something that's sustainable, that continues after five years, ten years. And if this can be a catalyst for change overall in Japan, that was even better. And after that, we wanted to make sure that we work with people we know, that variety of groups in New York and the U.S. will work together for the same goal. And in, in terms of the catalyst for change parts, uh, as you can see in this graph, mental health space in Japan is amongst the highest in the world. And this trend is something that many psychiatrists in Japan are trying to reverse. And we thought this would be a good opportunity by creating mental health clinics in the disaster affected area which are needed because of the lack of such facilities that this will also catalyze the movements towards the change in the national system. So our missions were 
establish self-sustaining outpatient-based mental health programs in areas that face a long-term need, which is Fushima Niwato, of course, and also become a catalyst for transition of mental health care programs in Japan. So, with this goal in mind, uh, Japan society was kind enough to uh, give us grants about $700,000 each to Fukushima and Iwate programs. Additionally, we have contributed almost $200,000 from the Japanese Medical Society for the same purpose. These programs actually are designed over three year period and the amount of money goes down every year because at the end of three years, we want to make sure the programs actually are sustainable, that they do not depend on outside help for a long period of time. And we have systems to make sure that programs are proceeding in terms of appropriate use of funds, as well as making sure that the needs of the patients are met. So, uh, in terms of collaboration, this is a complicated slide, so I don't expect you to memorize this, but it, it just shows you how we work together. And the red is the flow of the money, and the rest are relationships. So this is the kind of structure we envision and try to work with. So there is, of course, uh, Colombia, Mount Sinai, you mentioned, Fushima, GMSA, Jamsnet, and the, uh, where the money comes from over here. So there are a variety of ways we work together. Make, make something out of small pieces to achieve something important. So that's really what we're trying to do. So if you look at this, you have no idea what you're looking at. Maybe some of you do. So this is a part of a painting. So I consider ourselves to be little dots here or there. But when you put this all together, it becomes a wonderful painting. This is George Surratt's painting. And this is actually a uh, memorial to Dr. Lidio Noguchi. Uh, uh, who died in 1928. Actually, he was a Japanese scientist who was looking for the cause of yellow fever. And at that time, you couldn't see yellow fever because the viruses are too small to be seen by a microscope. So he actually contracted and died. And this is when uh, our medical society actually uh, cleaned the, his grave, which is actually in the Bronx, believe it or not. And on the back here, it says, through science, he lived and died for humanity. But my interpretation of this to today is through asterisk, but you can put anything here. Science, art, management skill, funding, publicity, moral support, whatever. He has to be, we have that she of course. Live and I don't want I, I, I didn't really like the first time, so <laughs> even more because I think by being able to contribute and do things, I think we, we, we actually live longer. It's something that's important for every human being to do. So, I would say through contribution in any of the areas that we have, we can live and even live more lively for the humanity. So, I think that's what I like today's take home message to be. I all we can work together contribute small pieces of what we can do to achieve something important for everyone. So with that, I'll end my talk and thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Homa. Next speaking will be Elisa Prager and Kirsten Homa. Lisa Prager is a second year medical student at Columbia University, and Kirsten Homa currently works at the Columbia University Medical Center as a research assistant, and will be joining the Columbia University Mailman of Public Health in the fall. And today they'll be speaking to you about the National Fellows Program. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Homa. Next speaking will be Elisa Prager my name is Elisa Krieger. 
Um, and I'm Kirsten Roma, and we are members of the Consortium for Japan Relief, as well as previous participants of the Nishimiya Fellows Program. And we're very excited to be talking about our experiences in this, in this program today. The Nishimiya Fellows Program began about a year ago and is named in honor of the late ambassador, Shinichi Nishimiya, who made significant contributions to Japan Relief efforts. And it is really targeted towards individuals with some knowledge of the Japanese language and a keen interest in the 311 disaster, as well as disaster recovery, medicine, Japan, or social activism. And it is a week-long radiation and disaster medicine seminar with a community outreach component. And it aims to allow students from the US to go to Fukushima and learn about radiation disaster medicine from experts in the field and also to contribute to Japan relief efforts through volunteering in the community. And also it aims to raise awareness about what happened and as well to promote communication and collaboration between <coughs> institutions, students and faculty between Japan and the US. This program takes place in June at Fukushima Medical University in Fukushima, Japan. And it is really the result of a collaboration of many different organizations, such as the Japanese Medical Support Network, the Rockefeller Group, the Education Center for Disaster Medicine at Fukushima Medical University, the Japanese Medical Society of America, Consortium for Japan Relief, and Dr. Shinichi Homa, who is the advisor of the program, and just to speak. In the summer of 2012, there were three participants. There were two medical students from Columbia University and one employee from the Columbia University Medical Center. And the program consisted of five days. The first two days were spent mainly attending seminars and activities at Fukushima Medical University. And the last three days were focused on volunteering and visiting key locations in the area. On the first day, we attended a seminar on radiation basics. We studied basic radiation biology, the different types of radiation, how to measure radiation, and different units of radiation. We also studied the history of past nuclear accidents, including Chernobyl and Hiroshima. We learned about what happened in Fukushima with a nuclear meltdown. And we also learned about the effects of radiation on human health, and the, in particular, the pathophysiology of thyroid cancer. In addition, we participated in many activities. We learned how to measure radiation levels in the environment with guided counters and interpret our findings. We also learned how to examine the thyroid gland with an ultrasound and to screen for thyroid cancer. On the next day, we attended a seminar where we talked about a clinical case of a patient who was exposed to radiation and also how to manage these individuals. And then we also learned how to communicate radiation risk and uh, address concerns about radiation exposure to people in the community, such as mothers and grandmothers and other family members, in particular about radiation in foods and in parks. And this was primarily to prepare us for our time in the community. We also learned how to triage patients in an event of a disaster um, and for example, like a fire or a tsunami with simulated patients. And again, we also learned how to um, take care of patients who are exposed to radiation contaminants. And we wore these gowns and went through step-by-step -step management. In addition, we were able to um, interact with students during these activities and also to interact with faculty and staff at Fukushima Medical University, which was a great learning experience. So on um, day three, we started going around to the community, and um, the first place we visited was a community center which posted a health fair every month. And you can see on the left that there's, um, that's actually a sign that talks about the levels of radiation um, that day, and that was not uncommon to find a lot of the establishments in Fukushima. Um, and this community center um, catered towards um, mothers and children in the local area, and there were a variety of booths, um, such as general health or general counseling or dental hygiene, and um, the people who, I guess, man these booths were uh, physicians, nurses, social workers, and 
can you never sort of basically um, lend their time for your charge to this effort? And at the end of the day, um, everyone, all the health professionals came together and discussed the cases that they had seen. Um, on the fourth day, we visited Jay Village, which used to be a national soccer training stadium that was converted to a base for nuclear cleanup workers after the 311 disaster. And it was um, a particularly, I guess, a good facility to use because not only was there a vast amount of space, but there was also medical equipment that could be used should workers be injured. But um, actually, it wasn't physical injury or even radiation contamination that was the number one health concern, but um, heat stroke. And as you can see on the right, the workers had to cover up, and so um, they overheated pretty easily. So at Jay Village, there was a lot of supplies needed for cleanup efforts, um, and therefore a lot of garbage that was accumulated, but which you can see on the bottom right. But all of that garbage was considered radioactive, but as of July 2012, when we were there, there was um, no place to put the garbage even once everything had been cleaned up. Um, on the fifth day, we visited the Kokoro no Care Mental Health Clinic, um, which was actually established with the help of Dr. Hilma. Um, and it was one of the first mental health allocation clinics established in the disaster-stricken areas. Um, later that day, with the staff from the clinic, we um, visited another temporary housing facility, and you can see what it looks like on the left, um, which was home to many um, elderly women. And the staff, um, whenever they visited that center, they um, usually did origami with the women or um, helped take uh, daily blood pressure readings for them. And while we were there, we had the opportunity to um, engage in those activities as well. Um, still on the last day, we also visited Minami Soma, which is a prefecture in Japan. I mean, sorry, Fukushima that was the most devastated by a tsunami. Um, you can see that on the right is a picture of the foundation of a house, and so the force of the water was so strong that it basically raised the building. Um, and there was still some garbage accumulated, um, which hadn't been disposed of yet. <coughs> So in Miami Soma was also, um, we saw a playground that was being built by a man who lost his uh, family in the tsunami. And he was doing it not only to pay homage to his lost family members, but to also encourage um, people to come back to the area. And I think that on the trip, this was probably one of the most touching things I saw because it spoke to the grassroots or individual level actions that people were taking and also our creative response to disaster, which is what this symposium is about. So after the end of the week, we received certificates of completion. And overall, we had a really great experience. Um, we, not, we learned so much, not only about the radiation and the radiation biology, but also about what actually happened in Fukushima and the impact of the disaster on people living there. And we also met many faculty and students at Fukushima Medical University, which greatly enhanced their learning experience. And we also wanted to talk about the program that will be occurring this summer. Um, there's funding available for one to two students to participate this summer. It will take place in June 2013. And the application is available on the CGR website. And it is due this month, March 29th. And for more information, please go to the website. And if you have any questions, feel free to email. Um, in conclusion, we want to thank everyone and all the institutions that are on this page. Um, and thank you very much for your time. <laughs>
high school organization in Japan called Team for 311. This high school organization reached out to us and they specifically wanted to be part of this organization, I mean, part of the symposium. So um, I think we owe it to them to show them, show you guys their video. So, 